Good evening, Mr. Chen, distinguished uh, guests and friends. Welcome to the ninth Sir Gordon Wu Distinguished Speaker Series on Chinese Business and Economy. My name uh, is Xiang Jingwei. I'm a, a NT1 Professor of Chinese Economy and Business at Columbia uh, Business School uh, and uh, Columbia's uh, School of International and Public Affairs. I'm also uh, the director of Jeremy A. Chazen Institute of International Business at Columbia uh, Business School. Sir so Gordon Wu has been actively and very heavily involved uh, in the Asian economic uh, miracle. And Sir so Gordon Wu Distinguished Speaker Forum is a semi-annual uh, event generally supported by Sir Gordon Wu and uh, hosted and organized by the Chazen Institute at Columbia University that provides a platform uh, for us to uh, listen to uh, and uh, learn from and exchange views with distinguished business leaders and, uh, 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 and, and political leaders about the uh, uh, Chinese uh, miracle and, and relevant uh, insight in particular. Tonight we have a wonderful opportunity to hear about the economic implications of the property boom uh, in mainland China and Hong Kong from a truly distinguished uh, speaker. But before I introduce the speaker, however, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, some uh, special guests in the, uh, in the audience. First, um, f first, Mr. Jerry Chazen. Where's uh, Jerry? Uh, Jerry is the, is the founder of the Jeremy A. Chazen Institute of International Business, which uh, sponsors tonight's uh, event. And Ms. Cynthia Wang, Cynthia, who, whose family established the NT1 Professorship of Chinese Business and Economy at Columbia University uh, in honor of her late father, Dr. NT Wang. And I have the particular honor and, uh, and privilege of holding this professorship uh, at, at the university. Ms. Lulu Chiu Wang, is uh, Lulu here already? Uh, uh, Ms. Lulu Chiu Wang has established a new um, a senior visiting scholarship program at the Columbia Business School that will uh, invite uh, uh, senior prominent academics or business and political leaders from uh, China to spend some time at, the, at uh, Columbia University, uh, starting from this fall, hopefully. Um, we have uh, many other special guests, uh, including uh, uh, Dr. Clyde Wu, uh, Mr. Washington Sisset, uh, and, and several other uh, distinguished speakers with whom I have not had an opportunity to know very well yet, but I uh, certainly hope to uh, get to know um, better tonight and, and over, over time. I would like to also brief uh, you to take advantage of this opportunity some uh, China-related initiative that uh, Columbia Business School uh, is engaged in, and we have many of them. I will give you a very brief introduction of them uh, uh, for sure. The school is to launch a new two-day executive education program in New York starting from this August called Global Business Strategy uh, China. This will be a joint venture with the premier business school in China. School's Global Executive MBA program, ranked number one globally by Financial uh, Times, has successfully launched a Global Asia branch in collaboration with the University of Hong Kong. Our Dean Glenn Hubbard will teach in the program uh, in Hong Kong uh, in June, and I uh, also will have the privilege to uh, teach in Hong Kong at the end, uh, end of July. The China Business Initiative, uh, a new initiative under the auspices of the Chazen Institute of International Business at the school, was launched last October and provides a platform uh, to, to learn and research on Chinese business practices. And the, the CBI initiative is uh, uh, directed by Professor Fang, Fang Ruo Chen from the school. The business school has a variety of other programs that are designed to help increase our students' exposure uh, to, to the world, and particularly uh, uh, China. For example, uh, just this spring, several of our programs, uh, collectively, our global M our MBA program, our MBA program, our student uh, uh, tours had uh, 100, over 150 students uh, in China. This is this spring alone, and over, over the years, we'll have 
uh, many more uh, students' involvement with exposure to, uh, to uh, China. Let me uh, now introduce to you our very distinguished speaker tonight, Mr. Ron Yi Chen. Mr. Ron Yi Chen is the chairman of Hanlong Group and its subsidiary is Hanlong Properties. This Hanlong Group was founded in 1960 and has been expanding uh, into mainland China at least since 1992. It's a, it, it's a group with uh, multi-billion dollars of uh, net uh, profits, if my information is uh, correct. Mr. Chen has also is co has co-founded Morningside Group uh, many decades ago, uh, which uh, owned, managed, manages companies focusing on manufacturing, public transport, outdoor advertising, media, healthcare, outline, uh, game opera operation, high tech and biotech investment in mainland uh, China, developmental capital investment in Southeast Asia, uh, and business in Europe, in North America, and so on. And I think uh, when Mr. Chen was founding uh, 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 this uh, Morningside Group, he was anticipating his association with Columbia uh, University, since the university is located on a piece of property called Morningside of New York City. Correct, I think he says. And Mr. Chan um, is also a vice chairman and board of the Asia Society and chairman of Hong Kong Center, founding trustee of African Asian Society, and many, many other uh, organizations, including the, uh, uh, being on the board of the uh, Peterson Institute of International uh, Economics, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Committee of 100, advisory board of the Center for Strategic International Studies in, in Jakarta, uh, and, and, and on board of many, many uh, uh, business entities. Mr. Chan is also a, uh, a distinguished and, and strong supporter of many educational endeavors. There's a very long list of universities in Hong Kong, in US, and other places that uh, uh, he's supporting and associated uh, with. Uh, and the list is uh, too long for me to read uh, to you uh, comprehensively, as I want to just uh, acknowledge like that. So please join, join me in a welcome, Mr. Ronnie Chan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I do want to uh, recognize uh, two or three people here in the room. First of all, Jerry Chazen, thanks very much for establishing the institute. Um, Jerry serves on the board of uh, a real estate company, uh, the principal of which is a longtime friend of mine. Uh, Clyde Wu, Dr. Clyde Wu, I think many of you know him. Uh, he's the older brother of uh, Sir Gordon. And uh, Gordon, let me tell you something about Gordon. Gordon, uh, Gordon is about 14 years younger than my father, my late father. And my late father used to call him the kid. <laughs> so when my late father passed on, Gordon say, I am 14 years older than you, so I call you the kid. <laughs> so I am the kid. But of course, Clyde is a big brother. Thank you for setting up this lecture series uh, for the family. And then uh, Washington Sissip. I think, I don't think there's anybody more senior in this room than Wash. <laughs> Wash, if it had not been for the war, when he joined the Air Force, uh, he would have finished his doctorate at Columbia, and that was 1943. And of course, Wash knows that I'm older than he is, and he calls me a big brother. And uh, many years ago, what, 12 years ago, we co-founded the Asia Business Council uh, based in Hong Kong, and uh, Wash has remained a wonderful friend. Uh, Professor Wei, you are correct that uh, I have something to do with Columbia. Uh, I have something to do with you, you don't know it yet. Uh, Morningside, my family company, did take the name from Morningside Drive outside of Columbia. I suppose some people may say, hey, Ronnie, you're just not smart enough to be accepted by Columbia. I didn't even try. So, um, so in your dreams, you dream of being a, a Columbia graduate, and hence you name your company Morningside. Well, you can interpret it which way, whichever way you want. But uh, this is not the first time I speak at the, at the Columbia University. Uh, it probably is the third. The last time 
My host was not Professor Wong, the NT1, uh, uh, Prof Professor Wei, the NT1 uh, professorship. Uh, it, was Mr. it was Professor NT Wang. Uh, he was my host, and uh, I address uh, SIPA. Uh, that was, must be, I think, something like 12, 14 years ago, and we certainly respect uh, Professor Wang very, very much. Well, this series is called the uh, Sir Gordon Wu Distinguished Lecture Series. And I was extraordinarily surprised when the title was given to me that I was supposed to talk about real estate. Because as far as I'm concerned, real estate and being distinguished are mutually exclusive. <laughs> of all the businesses, of all the businessmen and businesswomen, uh, the type that has that have the, the, the type that has the least respect got to be real estate people, and I see the lady sitting in the front row nodding her head. You agree with me? Uh, you know, in Japan, the real estate sector is uh, is uh, you, you tell people you're in the real estate business, people think you're a yakuza. In Hong Kong, when you say you're a real estate developer, uh, people probably admire you because. If you're still around, you probably have a lot of money. <laughs> but talking about respect, that is another story. So uh, to call this, I mean, to, to, to have me uh, be part of the distinguished lecture series and talking on real estate, uh, I'm in fear and trembling. So Clyde and uh, Jerry, pray for me. But anyway, real estate developers are really a special breed. Anywhere in the world, real estate developers are the ones who want to make a lot of money fast, right? There are many other people getting into other businesses. Jerry, you found a Liz Claiborne. In the retail business, it takes time to grow that business, right? And as a result, perhaps people respect you. In real estate, everybody want to make money, and they want to make money fast. And that's where the problem is. The problem is not to make a lot of money. I'm in the real estate business because I want to make a lot of money. I don't give a damn whether you respect me or not. Uh, when I have a lot of money, that's all I care. So to, to make a lot of money is not a problem. The problem is when you want to make a lot of money fast. The problem is with the word fast. In fact, to be successful in real estate, economic history tells us that you've got to be very, very patient. And yet real estate developer and patience seems to be, seem to be oxymorons. That if you're a developer, you're entrepreneurial, you want to make a lot of bucks, and you don't have patience. And that's how real estate developers don't make a lot of money. Or indeed, that's how real estate developers, many of them, lose their shirt. You hear of those real estate developers and you have red eyes disease, meaning that, wow, those guys have a lot of money. Well, probably true. But while you're thinking about it, just remember that there are many others who have lost the shirt. The ones that you, you see, the ones you talk to, are the ones that are surviving. And it is so easy for this business to lose money. I mean, of course, when you're young and ambitious, you think about making money. You don't think about losing money. But the reality is this business is a great way to lose money. My late father taught me, the one who calls Sir Gordon the kid, he taught me one thing. Before you know how to make money, before you learn how to make money, you better know how to not lose money. And that is the tough part. In this business, if you can hang in there and don't lose money, you will make money. Why? Because if you choose a market correctly, such as New York, such as Hong Kong, such as Spain and China today, property prices will go up over time. And even if you are dumb like me, you can make a lot of money. But only dumb people are patient. And so ladies and gentlemen, my message to you today is not to distinguish, I'm sorry, is that you gotta be a little dumb. And if you're a little dumb, you'll probably make a lot more money in real estate than otherwise. Now let me get back to perhaps a little bit more 
feign to be a little bit more distinguished and touch upon a little bit of economic history. If one were to ask me in the 20th century, what, where is the best economic opportunities? I would say before 1914 in the United States of America. Those were the days of the baron, the robber barons. Those were the days when this country was just beginning to take off. It was around in the 1880s, if not in the 1890s, that the United States began to overtake Britain as an economy. In, I think in 1890, the United States had something like 36 million people. But by the turn of the century, it had 63 million people. Natural resources was abundant. And so per capita natural resource was also abundant. Yes, the robber barons spent a lot of money, but there's so much to go around that a lot of people got part of the pie. So that was the 20th century. If you would ask me, well, what is the second best opportunity in the 20th century, because 1914 is a little long time ago, I would say perhaps after the Second World War, the rebuilding of the many countries. What about the 21st century? We are now all in the 21st century. Well, you may say the century is only 10% gone, right? How do I know? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I got good news for you. I think I'm right this time. The best economic opportunities of the 21st century is probably the first 30 years, if not 30, 40 years, in the mainland of China. Later, I hope to convince you that that is where the best opportunity <coughs> are. Then the next question is, OK, what is the best industry to be in? You know, my father got into the You know, my father and your father, actually, Dr. Clyde Wu, uh, they were friends. Yeah. They, were, they all got into the real estate around the same time. And, uh, and uh, if you were to ask the question, what industry then shall I get into? Well, if, you're, if the object is China, mainland China, then I would say it is a wrong question. Why? Because there are so many areas that we can make money in that the right answer ought to be what area not to be in. Right? When out of 100, 95 of them you can make money in, then don't ask me what are the 95. Just ask me what are the five. Everything else, basically, you can make a lot of money in. And such is the opportunity in the mainland of China today. One industry, however, stands out in the minds of many. And that is real estate. Why? Well, they look at Hong Kong, which is the forefront of economic development in the mainland of, uh, of China. And they say, who are the wealthiest guys in China? If you were to look at the top 10 guys, uh, eight of them has, well, actually, all 10 of them have real estate holding. But eight of them, one way or the other, have made real estate one of their main businesses. And so if eight out of 10, that's a pretty good bet. You want to be in, you want to make a lot of money in Hong Kong? Be in real estate. The only problem is that is true in the last 50 years. I'm not sure if it is true today. But Hong Kong, Hong Kong will be fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'm leading a delegation of the Better Hong Kong Foundation here to the United States this time, and our executive director, Karen Tang, is sitting there. And uh, Hong Kong is fine. Hong Kong will win. Hong Kong will succeed because of us, as well as in spite of us. Whether it be because of our own ability or the lack thereof, how can Hong Kong not do well sitting at, at a border of a 1.3 billion people market, which is growing at 9, 10% per annum? And if you were to go to the major cities, most of them are growing at 12, 11, 12, 13, 14% per annum. So Hong Kong cannot do badly. So, and, and, and Hong Kong is a mature market. So the focus, if I, if I were a young man, and I see many young men and young ladies here, if I were you, I'd go to mainland China. Provided that making a lot of money is your objective. Recognizing, of course, making money is not everybody's cup of tea, that's fine. We respect the professors, we respect the professionals, <laughs> we respect the medical doctors, 
They are the respectable ones in society. So not everybody has to make a lot of money. But if you want to make a lot of money, you know, I have two sons. My younger one is a do-gooder. So he wanted to be an occupational therapist. So he's getting his OTD. That's fine. I told him, son, are you sure you want to be in that? Your, 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 father, your brother may be in first class traveling for the rest of your, his life, and you will be at the back, you know? He said, I don't care. That's what I want to do. More power to him. My older son, he wanted to be in business. Where is he living today? Shanghai. Why? It's simple. This country has, this country has so many smart guys. Columbia and a few others, you know, New York U and whatever. There's so many smart guys. How the hell do I, as a dummy, compete with them? And my son has my genes, so I say, son, don't go to the United States. Thank God he has a little bit of my, my wife's genes in him. Uh, so what do you do? Go to a place where dummies can make money. Because the, error for, the, the margin for error is much bigger. The overall magnitude of opportunities are far bigger and far greater and more, far more plentiful. So he has been living in Shanghai. So people look at Hong Kong, or indeed if they were to look at Singapore, or they look at Thailand, the more advanced economies in Asia, one can easily come to the conclusion that real estate is going to be a fantastic business to be in. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that in the next 10, 20 years, you will, you will see tremendous amount of billionaires, US dollar, not RMB, although RMB will catch up one of these days, uh, will come from real estate in China. Now, we all know about why real estate is such a good business. I don't think, I, I don't want to insult your intelligence and, and, and go through all the things. So, you know, we all know about, you know, the leveraging, the, the big ticket item, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a wasting asset, and uh, it, 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 it appreciates sometimes in spite of you, you know, those are all good things. However, people don't talk about the bad things. That's one bad thing. Nobody talks about That is, it is not a highly, le it is not a leverageable business. Meaning that for every dollar you want to make, get out of it, you put in, you have to put in more inputs. Is not like Window, Microsoft, right? Get the, the smartest Columbia graduates or whatever, and uh, come up with uh, some software, and then once it is done, right, you can duplicate it for a penny uh, and sell them for a hundred bucks, right? It's highly the operating leverage is extraordinarily good in that business. In real estate, you don't have that. In real estate, you put in a dollar, hopefully you got a dollar twenty out of it. Right? And some people only get 80 cents out of it, but that's another story. So, so, so a as a result, you have to rely on leveraging. And you do, people do leverage, and it, you can leverage. But of course, as we all know, as the last two years of uh, 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 Wall Street has tell us, uh, uh, leveraging cuts both ways. Right? When times are good, bingo. When times are bad, you are dead. So, this is a unique business indeed. But let me zero in on the China market, or indeed the developing markets in general, provided that the government is basically doing the right thing. And sometimes the right thing to do is to do nothing. Okay? Uh, provided that the economy is relatively healthy and growing at a reasonable rate then the history of real estate in East Asia tells us one thing. There is a very unique characteristic of the real estate market in such, a, uh, in such an economy that very few people talk about. In fact, I've never heard of anybody talk about it. Think about this. Every trough, you know, real estate is obvious go up and down, right? Every trough is higher than two peaks ago. If you get nothing out of today's lecture, just take this one sentence and go home and mull over it. I've been in this business for 30 years. I've been operating in not just mainland China, Hong Kong, but mo most of East, Southeast Asia in real estate. And I come to the conclusion that the best thing about the market 
in a reasonably healthy economy and growing economy is that, or I repeat, every trough is higher than two peaks ago. What does that mean? That means as long as you don't over leverage, not only will you be bailed out, not only will you survive, you will thrive. I told people yesterday, I, I think I shocked them. Oh, this afternoon, I shocked them, I think. I said the real estate market in China is far more safe, far less risk than the US market. He's a journalist, he was shocked. Why is that the case? Well, in this country, you can borrow, oh, I don't know, 90%, right? Put in 10%, borrow 90%, or in the good days, put in 5%, borrow 95%, or in the good, good, good days, you put in nothing and get 110%. Anyway, <laughs> such obscenity does happen. And so, as long as, oh, so in the United States, if the market go down 10%, you're wiped out, right? Because there's fees, there's, there's costs involved. So the, if, you, if you put in 10% and the market go down 10%, you're 100% lost. In fact, you'll be in a hole. Of course, the flip side of that is what makes it so exciting. That if it goes up 10%, you double your money, right? But as, don't forget my late, what, 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 my, what my late father said. Before you know how to make money, know how to not lose money. Right? And if that's the case, then think about the downside before you think about the upside. The downside is that the market goes down 10%, you are wiped out. But in my part of the world, all you need to do is one thing. Don't over-borrow. And if you over-borrow, you better be smart enough to get out in time. If not, you're dead meat. And I've seen a lot of dead meat in Hong Kong and all over Asia and in mainland China as well, right? So as long as you don't over leverage, the market will not only bail you out, you will not only survive, you will indeed thrive. So this is a funny business, interesting business. The market has a very distinct characteristic that is different from anything else. And the developers, as I mentioned earlier, are very distinct, very different from anybody else. That is, they want to make money fast. And so, no wonder that the real estate market in the mainland of China has been thriving. I want to leave plenty of time. I know a lot of you are interested in uh, specific aspects of the Chinese market, which I'll, uh, I'll leave to um, the, 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 the discussion at the end, no, Q&A at the end. Suffice to say that the real estate market obviously is not just important to individuals. And I'm referring mostly to residential real estate for the time being. Huh? Later, I'll, I'll go, to, go on to the commercial. It's important to us because, you know, that's, hey, we need a home to stay, right? But you know, anybody know what percentage of the city dwellers in mainland China today own their own homes? Anybody know? Any idea? City dwellers, not the rural area. About 80%. Okay. Now, obviously, the, they got the, the housing from the government in the last 20 years, or the, from the government sale in the prices. And there's a tremendous amount of desire to trade up because those are usually not of the quality. But nonetheless, suffice to say that the real estate, the residential real estate obviously is extraordinarily important to the individual. Even if you are not one of those who want to make, money, make, money, make a lot of money fast. From a societal perspective, it's extraordinarily important. We all know that. It was estimated, Professor Wei, I don't know if you can confirm this, sometimes 20% of the economy, one way or the other, is somehow related to the real estate sector. Because of the, you know, the, 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 the wallpaper, the, the carpet, the wood, right, and the lamps and what have you, 20%, perhaps as much as, of the economy is related to the real estate sector. And so, if you get the real estate sector right, the economy can develop healthily. If you get the real estate sector wrong, you're gonna have some problem economically. Then of course, if you are a leader of China sitting in Beijing, you have other bigger problems to face. That is, you need to have a harmonious society. In order to have a harmonious society, the communist leaders know 
they're supposed to be Wu Chai Jie Ji, what do you call it? The, what, do, what do you call it in English? Proletariat, uh, the, well, there's not really. But anyway, uh, you're, supposed, you're supposed to have, you don't, you're supposed to own nothing. <laughs> okay. But they know today that the best way to maintain a harmonious society is if everybody owned their homes. And the history of every other economy in the, around the world has proven to us that whenever a large number, a large percentage of the population owns their own homes, that is a good way to maintain stability and harmony in society. So for that reason, if nothing else, it's extraordinarily important that the Chinese government must get the real estate market right. But of course, the flip side of that is also correct. The flip side of that is that if, for example, prices, for whatever reason, fluctuates too much, then you really have a problem, right? You, have, you can have social unrest in the short term. You will create a lot of social conflict for the long term that can, do, can be to the detriment of the entire society. So whether it's from a pers personal perspective or for, for, from the perspective of the government and society at large, this is very, very important. But let me argue for you the next point, that is, residential market is not the place that you want to be in. Why? Let me tell you why. I don't do residential real estate in the mainland of China only do commercial. Why? Well, several reasons. Number one, there's a lot of big boys there, a lot of big guys there. You've heard of the company called Vanke? Wang Ke, you've heard of it? Do you know that Vanke is the single largest residential developer in the whole wide world by volume? They sell something like 65, 70,000 units per year. What is Hong Kong market? The Hong Kong market for the last couple of years has been about twelve to 15,000 per year. So one company, they produce four to five times the total, total new stock of Hong Kong. One company. And there's probably five or six companies, if not six or seven companies in the mainland of China. Each one of them produces 30,000 or, or more. So there's a lot of big boys around. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need me to tell you I'm a short guy. Being a short guy since I was a kid, when big boys comes along, what do you do? Please, you go ahead. Don't fight with those guys, right? And so if I, I'm sure there's some investment bankers here. If I begin to get into residential real estate in the mainland of China, I suggest that you start dumping my stock. Bad business. That is a business that depends on quantity rather than quality. And when it comes to quantity, no one beats the Chinese. <laughs> right? So how the hell do I, a small guy from Hong Kong, compete with them in quantity? There's just no way. So that's not where I want to be. Moreover, tax is high. You know what's the tax rate if you were a real estate developer and build and sell? Anywhere from 40 to 50%. Okay. The corporate rate is not that high. But if you're in real estate, they have all kinds of ways. Don't forget, it's a communist government, OK? And they don't like landowners, although they re realize that you, they have to have it, so they're encouraging it. But they will try every way to get profit out of your pocket into their pocket. And so tax is high. Whereas for me, as a commercial developer, I build and own. I don't sell. My tax is far lower. But there's another more important reason. That is, don't forget that Chinese government, whether you call it communistic or whether you call it socialistic, it is a socialistic economy, country. The government, in order to maintain social harmony, will not allow residential prices to go crazy. That is a great way to destroy social harmony. This is a great way to bring in social unrest, right? Because you have a half and a half knot. The, dis the, the, the differential become too big. So they will do whatever they want, they can, to manage prices so that it doesn't go crazy. Now, whether they succeed or not is another thing. The last couple of years, they don't seem to have succeeded. But don't underestimate the Beijing government. 
whatever you do, if you want to do business in mainland China, just don't estimate, underestimate the government. Okay? So what does that mean? That means all the downside is yours. But the upside is going to be curved. Now, that to me is a one-sided bet that I don't like. I don't mind taking the risk, but I want to make all the upside. I told you already, as a real estate developer, I want to be very, very wealthy, right? Okay. So that's really not the place that you want to be. Then why do so many people get into it? Besides the big boys, you know, you have uh, China Resource, you have uh, China Overseas, right? You have Poly, and you have uh, 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 RNF, many, many big, huge companies in the residential field. Why then do people get into it? Well. Very simple. If you're starting afresh, if you have very little capital, you've got to churn your capital, right? And residential real estate is the fastest way and the easiest way to churn your capital. So I recognize that. And so if you're just starting afresh in somewhere in the mainland of China, you do residential, I understand. Of course, once you get into that, get into there, the difficulty is it is very difficult to transit from the residential side to the commercial side. I tell people, you know, is Yao Ming a great sportsman? Ladies and gentlemen, is Yao Ming a great sportsman? Yeah, Yao Ming, yeah, right? You know who's Li Ning? Yeah, Li Ning was in my office a few months ago. He's about my height, but he has four gold medals in gymnastics. He's the guy that walked on the walls, you know, uh, during the Olympic opening in Beijing, right? Is Li Ning a great sportsman? Yes, he's one of the best in the world. Yao Ming is one of the best sportsmen in the world, so is Li Ning. But this sport is not that sport. You tell Yao Ming to jump like Li Ning does, I guarantee you he'll break every bone. <laughs> right? Conversely, you want Li Ning or me to go play basketball, Yao Ming will dunk me instead of the ball. So people forgot that. They thought that you can migrate from residential to commercial. The reality is very few people succeed in doing that. But if you are one of the privileged few who can do that, then let me tell you what you are staring at. I'm so glad that Jerry left because he is my potential competitor. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, how would you like, let me describe a company to you. How would you like to have an unleveraged cash on cash return of 30% plus per annum? Is it, is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah, you can deal with that. Right? I'm not an investment banker, you know, so I don't, I don't talk about those obscene, you know, somebody told me he's going to start a hedge fund just now. Well, you know, those are obscene numbers, you know, oh gosh, you know. Uh, I'm a humble guy, okay? 30% unleveraged cash on cash return, fine with me. You have leverage up reasonably. You're looking at 45% return, right? Just do the simple arithmetics. How about this? This is not only a business that can create that kind of return, but it also creates quality recurrent income. You like that? Co quality, steady, recurrent income. Almost like an annuity. Now that's a darn good business. And then this business also has another characteristic. That is, it has very few competition. Hey, I'm a small guy. I don't like competition, right? I'm a, I can't fight with anybody, so don't give me competition. I find a place where there's no competition. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I got news for you. I found a place where there's no competition. You know, I'm the, sorry, if I'm the only guy in the world, although I'm ugly like me, all the girls, have a chance. How do you succeed? Find an area where there's no competition. And in China, there are places that there's no competition. Then you may say, ah, that must be a very small market. So it's a one-off situation that you can do it once, you know, and uh, you know, invest a little bit of a, uh, capital and that's it, no more opportunity. No, this market is almost limitless. As far as any real estate company is concerned, I don't care who you are. 
I think my company is probably now number seven biggest publicly traded real estate company in the world right now. We are nothing compared to the market. The, the number one, the biggest publicly listed, tra traded uh, real estate company in the world is in Hong Kong. And they're two times my size. But ladies and gentlemen, compared to the market, they too are nothing. Because the market is so humongous. There's another characteristic. That is, the business is very, very defendable. Once you do the right thing, get in there early, your position is almost unassailable. You will be able to collect almost like an annuity for many, many years to come. The final attractive thing about my business is the following. I'm not smart enough to go to Columbia Business School, I'm sorry. I have to apologize to my parents. <laughs> but uh, so I, I go look for a business that is very simple. My business is so simple that a non-Columbia Business School graduate can figure it out. Then, of course, you're a skeptic. You say, hey, if that's the case, how can the economic theory tells you that such a thing don't exist, right? Competition will come in and it will level the playing field and eventually it will, all the opportunity will be arbitraged away. Well, there must be a catch somewhere and here's a catch. The catch is that the execution of my business is horrendous. It's extraordinarily difficult to execute correctly. And the, every step of the way in the, in the value chain, you must get every step of the way correctly in order to produce the kind of return that I was talking about. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's, I'm so sad that I'm not smart enough to go to Columbia Business School, but I'm so happy that even without a degree from Columbia, there are some good opportunities in the mainland of China that a dummy like me can take advantage and make a lot of money. And so, real estate is a market to watch. I, I was really surprised that they wanted to talk about real estate. I said, oh, come on, you know, this is a distinguished lecture series. How can you talk about such a low industry? Until last week, I was in DC, talked to a lot of think tank people, talk to a lot of government officials, talk to a lot of some of the congressmen and so forth. Everybody was interested in Chinese real estate. So perhaps it is the brilliance of Professor Wei to uh, have picked this topic that uh, it should be brought to the fore. And uh, I was given 40 minutes, so I'm all, my, my time is almost up. But anyway, I think that for those of you who are, who are still young and ambitious, want to make a career, if you want to make a lot of money, I welcome you to China. That's where tremendous opportunities are. But you've got to be willing to hang in there, learn it the hard way. It's extraordinarily hard work, but the reward is also equally great. So I, perhaps I will end there. I think it's much better, Professor Wei, to, uh, I think a lot of you have a lot of questions uh, and maybe a more in, uh, interactive dialogue may be a bit better. Thank you very much. Professor. <laughs> Mr. Chang has uh, kindly agreed to take some questions and has promised to give you very brilliant answers. <laughs> that is Professor Wei's promise. <laughs> If you, if you don't mind, uh, first uh, state your name and your affiliation, and, and then ask the question. There's a question in the back. Hi, Ronnie. Thanks for your Columbia I'm graduates saying, yeah, are now not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to ask you, uh, since I couldn't do it in person with you, uh, the Remy B funds that are coming up for property versus an opportunity fund. Advantages that you see going forward, and because the Chinese don't don't need U.S. capital, so can you elaborate on that? 
Well, that is a very technical question, which I don't think is of uh, perhaps not a, 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 of broad interest to everyone. So I'll just make a very simple observation, and that is, you are correct. The Chinese government really, really don't want any more people buying RMB, right? They don't want to see the appreciation uh, too fast, uh, and hence, hey, if you, and, and that's number one. Number two, there's so much capital in the system, right, inherent in the Chinese system, that they really need to channel it somewhere. So in the old days, they bring in foreign capitals. But now, increasingly, they need to find ways to uh, use the local domestic uh, capital uh, uh, for all those reasons I, I mentioned. So I think this is a, a, a systemic trend. It's not just a cyclical thing. Like it or not, it's going to be moving in that direction. Uh, more and more uh, investment vehicles will be denominated in RMB. Uh, so, so, so de but it, it depends on who your, uh, who your investors are. If your investors are people that are from this country, then I suppose the U.S. dollars is fine. Uh, you may have to jump through a few, well, both, both, either way you have to jump through a lot of hoops, loops, or hoops or whatever in, in China in order to get things done. Uh, but I think that the, the direction that they're moving is, uh, is toward uh, RMB. Yes, sir. There is a lot of talk on Wall Street of late about a bubble, a bubble developing in uh, China both because the rate of growth is much too fast and uh, because of the real estate situation, uh, which also is going, growing much too fast. What are your views on this situation? Okay, I love your, the way you, your, your accent is wonderful, especially the way you say the word bubble. Oh, <laughs> so class, so classy. Anyway, uh, you know, it is really interesting. Who talks about bubbles? Academics talk about bubbles. Journalists talk about bubbles. There's one kind of people who never talk about bubbles. The developers. Why? We love them. <laughs> if there's no bubble, how the hell do you make a lot of money? Right? Now, obviously, you have to be savvy enough to foresee it, and then you have to also foresee is breaking, the breaking of it. Right? That's a hard part. And very few people can do it. And I'm happy to report that for the last 20 years, my company, my management team basically have caught right every time, both in Hong Kong and in the mainland of China. But let me first come to the definitional issue about bubbles. People today, I mean, they're, they're, I'm a dumb guy, I told you already. There's a lot of smart guys out there, but I just don't understand how come they don't use their brain. What is a bubble? A bubble is something that, no substance. Right? You touch it, you don't need the needle, you just touch it with your finger, bubble goes. That's a bubble. The fact that prices go very high does not translate automatically to a bubble. 1989 in Japan, when there's so much money chasing after deals, just too much money, right? There's no, need, no real demand, and then that was a bubble. That's a classic, classical bubble. But my question to you and to the journalists and to the academicians are this. Are there real demand in mainland China, of China, say for residential? The answer is the demand far outstrip the supply. The potential demand is huge, right? If that's the case, then there's no bubble. Thank God there's no bubble in China. Then why do all the, why do all the newspapers talk about bubble? Because they're dumb. They don't analyze what is a bubble, right? So whichever way you say it, my way or your way, sir, I like your way better, bubble. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna answer this question first. Uh, so, so, number one, I don't think it's a bubble to start with. But I said the price has gone up a lot, very high. Here I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, the following. Cyclically, Chinese real estate, residential real estate, in Shanghai and Beijing included, is quite expensive, quite high. But systemically, prices in Shanghai and Beijing are cheap. Why do I say that? If you were to compare Shanghai price today with Shanghai price five years ago, then I'll say you're dumb. It's a fast rising economy. Of course, real estate prices will go up very quickly, right? And because, if, because of that you don't buy, then you don't deserve to be successful in monetary terms, right? The right comparison 
is to look at Shanghai today with of uh, is to compare it to Singapore today or Hong Kong today or New York today. When you do that, then Shanghai properties become very cheap. If you were to take off, cut off the, 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 the two ends of a bell curve, the, the two, three percent here, two, three percent there, and take the middle part, and then you took, look at the most expensive one. Shanghai, what? Beijing, you're talking about, what, 60 RMB per square meter, roughly? So what does that translate to? That translates to uh, uh, eight, eight, called 800 US dollars a square foot. How much is the good stuff here selling in this town? 4,000? Or maybe, or more, huh? Lower, or Time Warner, building. We're selling at, I'm talking the, the top stuff, right? I'm like with like, compare like with like. It's selling at 4,000. 3,000, okay, 3,000. Then my friend got chipped, but anyway. <laughs> Hong Kong. Hong Kong, you're talking about four to five thousand dollars US a square foot, right? And Shanghai is how much? Eight hundred. So compared to four thousand, is one fifth, twenty percent. Now, ladies and gentlemen, which economy is growing faster? Hong Kong or Shanghai? Shanghai. Which currency has better appreciation potential? The RMB instead of the Hong Kong dollar, right? So why should Shanghai be selling at $800 US dollars a square foot while Hong Kong is selling at 5000 5, or 4000 right? And so you look at it from the right perspective, as far as I'm concerned, then it is quite cheap. It is not expensive at all. But then, of course, cyclically, I said, it is expensive. And let me tell you what I ascribe it to. And again, th nobody talk about this. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just too dumb or something. You know, the, the, the Beijing government has been basically reading the market correctly for the last eight, 10 years. The fact that they have not been able to bring prices down between 2005 and 2009, or 2008, is mainly because they were too light-handed. In the, in the measures that they put in place to bring prices down. It's not because they read the market wrongly. They read the market very right, very correctly, very impressive, but because they were too light-handed. And it's easy for you and me to criticize them for not having the desired result. But on that hand, if you are the responsible person in Beijing, when you are light-handed, you can always have another measure, another measure to try to bring it down. Whereas if you overdo it, the economic consequences can be very, very onerous. So they keep erring on the light-handed side. But then in the second quarter of 2008, the Beijing, was a, Beijing leaders were the first to recognize that the situation has turned and they begin to pop up the prices rather than push it down. But it's too late by that. Because, it, it, because of, you know, the, 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 uh, Bear Stearns followed by Lehman and Fetty and Fanny and, and AIG and this and that. It's just too fast. And so China's export turned from 20 plus positive year to year growth to minus 27. So it's a swing of 50 some percent. And so because of that, prices came crashing down. But that was the second, the third and fourth quarter of 2008. Can I tell you a story? It's sort of fun. In, in the fourth quarter of 2008, I systematically invited chairman and, or CEO of the top real estate companies in China to my Hong Kong office for lunch or dinner. They invariably tell me two things. One, thank God I didn't overborrow. Number two, thank God I didn't pay high prices to buy land in the last two years total lies. And then I tell them three things. <laughs> Number one, my company is debt free. We have zero debt. Number two, we have a lot of cash on hand. And number three, we make decisions very, very fast. And by, that, by, by the time I get to point number three, these guys' eyes were big. That shows that they were lying. <laughs> now, of 
course, the reason I invite him to dinner is to say, hey, if you are ooh, ready to die, you know, give me a call. You know, we have a lot of cash. And if there's some good stuff, maybe I can pick it up. Well, eventually, how much did I have to pick up? Zero. Why? Because by the first quarter of 2009, the government bailed them out. What did the government do? The government made a mistake, a tactical mistake. They read the market correctly. But instead of just saving the real estate market, they saved the real estate developers in the process. Then what happened? Then the government pumped, as you know, 9 trillion RMB into the market, something like 1.2 trillion RMB per month for seven months in a row. And Economics 101 tells you that when you pump that much money in an economy, asset prices are going to go up, right? So what, what, what would you do if you were that liar sitting in my office, right, in this fourth quarter of 2008? Fast forward it four months, five months, March of 2009. What would you do when that much money is pumped into the system and you see property land prices going up? You buy. Why? Because if you don't buy and the market keeps going up, you will look bad vis-a-vis -vis your competitors. On the other hand, if the market turns south, hey, the last time I was almost bankrupt, technically they were all bankrupt, right? Just four months ago, I was technically bankrupt, but the government bailed me out. So next time around, the government will be there again. So it would be crazy for me not to jump into the market with full force and begin to buy. So what, what does that produce? That produces a moral hazard, not unlike investment banking in this country. That is, you privatize the profits and you nationalize the debt or the losses, right? So these guys went crazy. They went ballistic. And these guys begin to buy land like there's no tomorrow. It is just human nature. They're just economic animals. <laughs> What's so new, right? But this time around, the government realized that inflation is rearing its ugly head. Religious developers are getting out of hand. Social harmony is being damaged because now these, the, the, the common saying in mainland China is a graduate from Tsinghua University, Beida University, there's no real prospect for them in their, I don't know, first 20 years or whatever of their career to buy a home. And as you know, the, the Chinese, like many other Asians, love real estate, right? The hard asset. And girls will not marry you. Don't laugh, it's true. Girls won't marry you unless you have a new apartment, right? And the, parent, the, the future parent-in-law will not let you marry their daughter unless you give her an apartment. So what happened? Price. So this time around, I think the government is very determined to bring prices down. So let's, again, don't underestimate Beijing. When they need to do something, when they want to do something, they will do it. So what am I doing? I'm laughing. All those guys who are technically bankrupt, who deprived me, the government deprived me of the opportunity to pick up the good stuff, they are all in trouble again. Wonderful. I'm, that's why I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go home. Maybe I should go back and invite all those people to dinner again. <laughs> I had lunch the other day. Um, my question is that for, I guess, the actual small people like us, how would you get access into commercial real estate market in China? I mean, it sounds like doing it in the residential way is kind of toxic. It's the more traditional way of smaller players to get involved. What's the most practical way for us to get involved besides maybe buying your stock? I was just thinking as she was asking the question, she works for a bong standard. She must be smart. But how come she's so dumb until her last sentence? And that is, buy my stock. <laughs> it, truly, in the commercial side of things, it's very difficult. If I were just starting out in life, wanted to be in real estate, and I don't want to be a developer, I buy residential. I buy 
in the best cities, and I buy in the best location, and I buy way beyond my means. Look back at the history of Hong Kong. Many of you come from Hong Kong here. Right. That I know of many British people who came to Hong Kong 30 years ago. They work for whoever, and then the smartest of them, whatever money they have, just pile in to buy top real estate, way beyond their means. And 20 years later when they retire, what happened? What they make in that one property, okay, keep trading up of course, huh? what they make in selling that one property is far more than all the salary of their 30 years of career at together. And I'll be happy to bet that if you buy right in the mainland of China, that perhaps not as, ludic uh, not as lucrative as that, but I think that there is a good chance that you will make very good money in the next 10 to 20 years. Even if you buy at the height of the market, as long as you don't over borrow, you should be okay. But of course, if you want to participate in, in commercial real estate, buy my company, stocks. And uh, Stockho is 1010, that's parent company, and 101. For those of you who know the next joke, 010 is what? 10, right? What is 10? Bo Derek. <laughs> what is 101? Dalmatian. So Bo Derek with the Dalmatians on the beach, that's Hanglong. We are as beautiful as that. Anyway, I'm not here to sell myself. I'm sorry. major cities, but I have had the pleasure to be in your country on the beaches and the areas even not far from Hong Kong and mainland China. Are there any other areas where people should look to invite the small fry like ourselves to think of buying even a beach house or a resort that they can go to once in a while? Absolutely. You know what has been happening to Hainan Island, right? Sanya in particular, but even Haiko as well. And uh, let me tell you a story. My brother lives there. I have a, I have a young brother that lives there, and he does the real estate development there too. And he tells me, he said, you know, this, this is like Hawaii. White, fine, sandy beach that is go for, you know, quite, quite a few miles. And uh, he said, you know, imagine you live in northeast China, and uh, the first time they got off the plane in uh, sunny uh, Sanya, and these guys just bow and kiss the ground and say, God bless China that we have still have such beautiful places. That's true. And those unique kind of properties, uh, uh, and, and China is so limited, right, uh, in, in such kind of beautiful resort properties that it's going to be fine. Uh, in fact, I tell, I, I'm an advisor to the province of Hainan. Hainan. And they want, they, and they, they're turning the thing into a tourism you know, island, which is right, the right thing to do. However, they keep talking about international tourists. And as an advisor, I told them, hey, forget about it. You know, the Chinese tourists in much of the world now, on a per capita basis, outspend anybody. Outspend the Japanese, outspend the German, outspend the Americans. And there's 1.3 billion of them, most of them are rising in income, right? So in the long run, just one little island called Hainan, right? Servicing 1.3 billion people who are rising in their standard of living. Do you think that buying there a beach home, if you can find one, don't you think that you'll be even wealthier tomorrow than you are today? Ladies and gentlemen, a wealthy lady. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have time to take more questions, but Mr. Chang, uh, we'll stay here uh, a bit more. Uh for, for you to ask him, exchange views with him uh, privately. Before I conclude uh, tonight's uh, formal uh, uh, event, the two orders of business. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the uh, contribution of, uh, of chasing uh, staff who are responsible for the logistics of tonight's event. Uh, I saw, uh, I see uh, 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 George Serpia here, um, uh, Katrina Banners and Jennifer Trump, <coughs> Jennifer Jennifer Zhang here, and uh, Carrie, Carrie Few. So, Thank you very much. For, for, uh, <laughs> I just going to have a small, small gift for uh, Mr. Chiang, for him to remember uh, this morning's, uh, the morning side in, uh, in New York City. 
Thank and please join me also thanking him for, for his time, for his insight.